Welcome to Ida History, the show that digs up the most thought-provoking stories from Idaho's history. Here are your hosts, Jeff Wade and Mark Iverson. That's right, you are listening to Ida History. I'm Jeff, and sitting uncomfortably close to me is my BFF, Marky Mark. What's How up, Mark? How you doing? My name is Mark, and uh, Jeff, you smell wonderful. Thanks, I did take a shower right before we began. Oh. You know, it's once a week at least. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, stick in a stick in a sponge. Stick in a poke? Poke in a stick. <laughs> Not sure what that means. I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, before we get into our uh, our episode today, I don't think we talked yet about our, uh, our awesome uh, music that we have on our podcast. Have, have we talked about that yet? I don't think so. Uh, they're a cool band from Emmett, right? That's right, yeah. So it's a band called Devil's County. Wow. Yeah, wow. yeah. great That's name, right? Head. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the song is called Highway 55, and it's all about going from the small town to the city of trees and uh, having a little having a little fun. So it's a great tune. Um, so we'd like to thank Devil's County for letting us use that song for our, uh, our podcast music. Um, but yeah, they're a great band. Check them out on Spotify or I'm sure Apple Music, wherever you get your music. I think they're on. So support local music and definitely history. Support us, please. Just through my do it. Just through my devil horns in the devil air to that. Devil horns in the air. Wave them around like you just don't care. I gotta remember sometimes it's a podcast and people can't see what we're doing. Oh, here. that's right. Yeah. Uh, speaking of what we're doing here, uh, let's get into this episode today, Mark. Let's get into the meat. The meat of the history. The meaty bits. The meaty bits. The hangy bits. The ghibli bits. All right. Let's do that. So, Mark, you know, we both kind of have particular interests in history. And, you know, I'm sure most people do, right? Uh, some people enjoy the history of knitting. Or I do. cheese making. Yes. Or prostitutes. Definitely. That... They go well together. Prostitutes, knitting, uh, cheese mongering. I'm sure there's a lot of knitting going on in brothels. We'll... Uh... The times Actually, were slow. There is. Yeah, there is. I have a story, but I'll save that. <laughs> but yeah, we talked more about that. Um, I think in our last episode, or maybe it's our next episode. We'll figure that out. Yeah, you'll I see. Mean, it on we'll the feed. record it, but after this, but we'll air it first. So we, yeah, we totally know what we're doing. Anyway, prostitutes. Oh wait, no. So now it's my turn. Um, so Mark, since I started this journey, I have kind of always been interested in the civil war in the Pacific Northwest, especially of course here in Idaho, because there's a lot about it that people do not know. Yeah. It's kind of cool. People will be like the civil war Pacific Northwest. You do say. And, uh, yeah. So I guess in the civil war, Idaho is kind of the red-headed stepchild of the Union and Confederates during the Civil War. So um, what is it that interests you about this kind of like specific part of this particular topic? You know, just because I think it's an area that hasn't really been studied or discussed much. Um, and it really hasn't been portrayed in the popular media at all. You know, we talk about slavery, John Brown, Fort Sumter, Gettysburg, and the Lincoln assassination, which all are very important events. But what was happening here in the West was equally important to the war effort. You know, Mark, back in uh, uh, the fourth grade, you know, we had Idaho history class. Uh, and we talked about the trappers. We talked about gold mines. We talked about, um, you know, Native American stuff. But we'd never really talked about the civil war and why it was so important to idaho and it was important to idaho history because it's the reason why idaho become a terror became a territory and you know i think we're gonna talk about that more as we kind of go on with the show um but this topic today i think it's a good place to start so what exactly are we talking about in this episode so we're gonna talk about the 1864 election in boise city idaho territory not only that, we're going to talk about the possibility that it was largely, and you know, God, I, I hate to use this term, but uh, uh, stolen by Southern Democrats. Well, now, Jeff, that's quite the accusation. Uh, do you have evidence to back this claim up? I sure do, Mark. And actually, you helped dig up some of that evidence at the Idaho City Archive. 
Um, but before we get heavily into that, let's talk. Let's kind of back it up and talk a little bit about the origins of Idaho and how it came to be split between Northerners and Southerners in Idaho. Mark, why don't you tell us a little bit about the gold and then our hills? In them there are hills, yes. Always in the hills, but not really always in the hills. Frequently in the hills. Um, so I don't think anybody will be surprised when I say, you know, gold is pretty much the reason Idaho exists, is a thing, is a state. Um, we all know, and not just in Idaho, but, you know, in everywhere American history, that uh, Lewis and Clark came out west at the Corps of Discovery in... What, 18 dickety four? 18 dickety five? They come through where Idaho is. And, something like that, yeah. Yeah, something like that. And they make their way down the Snake River and, uh, right? And then some rivers snake it to the Pacific, and it's all easy from there on out. Right. Um, but they eventually, they survive and they go back east and they have maps and notes. And so the fur traders, right? John Jacob Astor, Astoria. Great town, failed for adventure, <laughs> Goonies, you know, forever. <laughs> um, but anyway, so so some fur trappers come through the Boise Valley, through Idaho, um, all over the place, really. And uh, so we learn about that, uh, that you know, the first e economy, kind of like large scale economic kind of movement in American history. It comes through here. Um and then you have uh, Captain Elias D. Pierce. Later, uh, he f discovers gold uh, up in the Nez Pierce Reservation in 1860. Um, and then, you know, they find gold on the Salmon River in 1861. These stories deserve their own episodes, definitely. Um, big moments in Idaho history. But in the Boise Basin in August of 1862, a dude named George Grimes, he finds gold up there on Grimes Creek. What a quinky dink, eh? Right. Yeah. Uh, and then he dies. He's shot. And uh, he's still buried up there. Jeff and I have been up there. Pretty cool place. Tried to dig him up, but uh, yeah, yeah. the ground was too frozen. I know, right? Yeah. Uh, we needed a pry bar, really. Yeah. Rocks. Um, so anyway, um, you know, they find gold in the Oahe Mountains. Uh, and, you know, eventually... Uh, they founded the Idaho Territory in March of 1863. But, uh, Jeff... What else was going on? Well, Mark, you know, on April 12th, 1861, there was uh, some dudes with some cannons and guns and stuff, and they started shooting at a place called Fort Sumter in South Carolina. And these uh, these, these men were Confederates, basically. Um, but this action kicked off the United States Civil War. This is about six months after the first gold discovery happened in Idaho, and the war would last all the way till 1865. So, you have a situation where the first few years of Idaho's existence, the Civil War was waging on the other side of the continent. Idaho Territory was created with the intent to be able to protect the gold mines from Confederate conspiracies, of which there are quite a few going on in the Pacific Northwest at the time. What? Yeah. Crazy. Damn. Crazy, huh? So I'm going to give a couple examples, and I could talk about this all day because, again, this is my favorite subject, but I'm going to try to give you a real quick, you know, lesson here. The actual cause of the, the actual outbreak of the Civil War was the 1860 presidential election. So, Mark, why don't you tell us about the 1860 presidential election? All right. So the Democrats in uh, some say a move of stupidity, I say. Uh, yeah, it probably was. Split their party into the northern and the southern factions. Uh, northern Dems were more about letting slavery continue on as it had been and was. But the southern Dems were all about fighting hard to keep it going. And of course, you had a Republican candidate. Uh, I know it's a little flippy, <laughs> but uh, the guy from Illinois uh, who liked to wear the top hat. If you will, he had a sweet beard. Later he had on. a sweet beard. Um, yeah, old Abraham Lincoln, the abolitionist. Um, you know, abolition being a little different than I think we think of, but Abe was an abolitionist prior to you know that was one of his big running points, right? Um, but the Southern Demo Democrats nominated a guy named John 
see Breckenridge. For, I mean, we all know of Breckenridge, don't we? Of course, he still yeah. hasn't faded from he's history. The, he's the guy. <laughs> uh, and his running mate was a, a fellow named Joseph Lane. And Lay w- uh, Lane was super pro-Confederate. Um, like, he'd be the guy in the pickup truck with Confederate flags waving, probably right next to the American uh, flag. Not back then, though, oh, so maybe yeah. not. He'd just be straight up Confederate flag. Yeah. Okay. Um <laughs> And it blows smoke all over in your face, and he's like, "That's freedom, right?" <laughs> but he had he had also served as a major major figure in the Rogue uh, River War in Oregon. I'm sure you all know about that. Uh, and he was an Oregon territorial governor and an Oregon territorial senator. And he was, you know, I think it might not surprise people to know that he was a Ducks fan. Of course, a very you know a, a good football team, uh, but the most jackassy fans in the Pac-12, um, soon to be the Big Ten. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, Confederates, most Confederates were Duck fans. It's just a true thing. Yeah. That's why they call that game every year the Civil War, right? Because yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Right. Yeah, the Battle of uh, Quackersville. Quackers. Quackersville. So yeah, in addition to all that, um, Joseph Lane was actually a key figure of a group called the Knights of the Golden Circle. Like Camelot? Uh, it's just a model. Oh, okay. So the KGC started uh, actually before the war as, quote, Southern Rights Clubs because slavery, as we all know, was outlawed in uh, the 1810s, or the international slave trade, anyway, was outlawed. Um, so the the kind of the, the slavery as an institution was kind of, a lot of people thought it was fading away by the time you get to the Civil War. But you got chattel slavery kind of coming along because of the outlawing, right? Exactly. So you, what that means is basically a slave has a child and that child also becomes a slave. So that was the only way slavery was being continued at the time. Well, and then the, the illegal slave trade, of course. But the point being that um, a lot of Southern men at the time thought that their way of life was being threatened. So they organized these Southern rights clubs to kind of, you know, push their political and business interests. Anyway, um, so this this uh, Knights of the Golden Circle group, they started as Southern rights clubs, but they, they morphed into this large organization that had their sights set on taking over a large chunk of the Western Hemisphere and turning it into a slavery empire. Uh, but during the war, they kind of went underground and became spies and secret agents for the Confederate government. So you're saying Joseph Lane, the guy who almost became vice president, was a member of this secret confederate, dare I say, cult. But yeah, he and a lot of other people out here in the West at the time were members of this group. And I want to clarify that not all people who harbored Southern sympathies were members of this organization, um, but many actually were. Either way, though, they left their mark not only on the Pacific Northwest, but Idaho as well. But true, there are many places in Idaho that bear southern names. Leesburg, Dixie, Secesh River, Atlanta, Confederate Gulch. That one's a little on the nose, Confederate Gulch. Right, right. yeah. It's... Grayback uh, Gulch and uh, Davisburg. Okay, that one's not real. Is that, no, that's not nothing. I just okay. fucking around. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that brings us to Standifer Street in Placerville, uh, up in the Boise Basin. And uh, I just know, know a guy who wrote a book on Jeff Standifer, um, and his name is Jeff Wade, J.D. Wade. That's, uh, that's me, I guess. So yeah, I sure did. I wrote a book uh, about this guy named Jefferson J. Standifer. So he was the first sheriff of Idaho County. He led the third party of men into the Boise Basin to find gold. He also helped build, if you've ever been to, up to Placerville, there's a building on the, the main plaza there. It's called Magnolia Saloon. I think it's now a little museum. Um, but that is one of the original buildings, the original structures in the Boise Basin. I think it uh, goes all the way back to 1863. Um, but Jeff Stanifer had a hand in building the saloon. And then in March of 1863, he put together a party of men to, quote, punish the natives that were attacking the wagon trains into the area. So you have the situation where these miners were trying to establish their mines, but to do that, you need supplies. Unfortunately, the natives were attacking all of the, the wagon trains that were coming into the mines. Um, so 
they couldn't get the supplies they needed. Um, the stuff that was getting through, the prices were ridiculously high. So Stanford's Rangers, as they were called, they left Idaho City just a few days before Idaho became a territory, and they ended up fighting several engagements with what, at the time, they called the Snake Indians. Um, now we call them Bannock, Northern Paiute, Shoshone. And so this was before Fort Boise, right? Uh, the one not in Parma for fur trading, but the one in the city of Boise, the military post. Um, what, that was July of 1863, wasn't it? Yeah, 4th of July, right, is when it was officially Yeah, exactly, established. same day as Gettysburg, Gettysburg was being fought. Mm-hmm. Um, so what happened when the military came here? So Colonel Pickney Luganbeal, I think he was colonel at the time, right? And later, I thought he was a major, and then later he became a colonel. I'm trying to remember my military ranks now. But yeah, no, I think you're right. I am. Okay, good. Maybe, but now you're going to look, and then later you'll tell me. <laughs> On air, I hope. Okay. Either way, uh, so Pickney Luganbeal, uh, he commanded this this uh, contingent of troops. And so, yeah, so when Pickney Luganbeal uh, and his troops rolled into town, they had actually had two sets of orders, right? So one was to, like we just talked about, build a fort, which, you know, Fort Boise, you can go see some of those buildings still. They played softball there in the 1860s from what I understand. Softball? What else? I don't know if you're joking about that or... Cricket. (laughs) No, that's more of a British thing. Polo. Horse polo. Polo. Not water polo. Horse polo. They did do that for sure. Anyway, I I digress. I hope you digest too. I digest while I digress. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, so the, like I said, the first set of orders was to build a fort, and the second set of orders that they had from um, General Alvord was to disperse Stanford's Rangers because they feared that it was a, quote, secessionist militia. And it, it actually probably was because uh, Jeff Stanford, the leader of this group, was a member of the Knights of the Golden Circle you're saying they're secession? They <laughs> sure are. They ain't Billy Yank. They're Johnny Rebs. Huh? They got gray in their blood. Gray, gray in their blood. So that's also something that we need to do maybe an episode or two on. But anyway, let's move on to the year after that in 1864 and the election in October of that year, which is the actual topic of this episode. Okay, so to set the stage for this election, uh, Boise City was... Did I say that right? Boy, C. Man, I've gotten torn up about that before. Boise, boy, C. Just as a quick little thing, um, my neighbor down the street, uh, and a couple of times I was, uh, you know, I, I had spent quite some time scooping or shoveling snow out of her driveway. And I was having a conversation with her mother, um, who thanked me for doing that. But I said, Boise, and she was like, if you're going to move here, you might as well learn how to say it. And I was like, well, okay, Boise, and guess who is never going to uh, uh, shovel your daughter's driveway ever again? (laughs) But anyway, I digress. I was Uh, born and raised here, and I still don't say it right half the time, so. um, You know, so anyway, uh, I guess I should get back to what we were talking about, but... uh, yeah, so uh, Fort Boise was established, and then the city of Boise was platted uh, just a few days later by some of the, the founding fathers, uh, Thomas Davis, uh, husband to Julia Davis and all. You know, uh, what's the guy with the cabin on Fort Street? You know, the old cabin, oh. the oldest building in Boise. Oh, Farrell. Yeah, yeah, Will yeah. Farrell. Will Farrell, that's yeah. right. Will Farrell. Will Farrell. Um, but anyway, so it was a supply point... Uh, between the Boise Basin and the Oahe Mines, and it was kind of on an offshoot of the Oregon Trail, uh, Goodall's Cutoff. Um, but so it was a great location, and uh, so you farms and ranches started to develop in the area, and then, so this became a mercantile hub. I call it a mining supply town. But it was decided to hold uh, the election there in 1864, um, and it w- happened in October of 1864. And on the ballot were several county level offices, such as, uh, let's see, the auditor, uh, county clerk, county treasurer, and the sheriff, as well as a territorial auditor and treasurer. 
But the most important race was uh, the territorial representative to the U.S. Congress. And so this would be the man who would go to Washington to represent all of the Idaho territory. Um, so it was a critical race. And I do intentionally say man, because in these days, uh, women weren't in that game, obviously. Uh, it's true. So I think, Mark, uh, we've got a kind of a good setup for our, uh, our story here. So why don't we take a quick uh, commercial break and then we'll come on back and we'll, we'll talk more about this election. So. Sound good? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Jeff, I'm not sure you're aware, but uh, we're in the history business. Oh, yeah? Uh, the Ida history business. And we go to lots of historic sites, and uh, we always talk about how best to preserve them. You got any ideas? You know, one way is 3D scanning, and there's a great company based right here in Boise, Idaho, called Datum Tech Solutions. Do tell. Datum Tech Solutions can sell and rent survey equipment and construction technology such as total stations, GPS location tools, drones, and 3D scanners. They also train people how to use them. And Mark, these services are used by general contractors, mechanical and plumbing companies, architects, engineers, public safety organizations, and historical societies. So if you want to know more about Datum Tech Solutions, visit at their website at datumtechsolutions.com. Hey, Mark, I'm trying to find a book. Do you know any bookstores in this area? I do, Jeff. Right in downtown Meridian, a soon-to-be a brick-and-mortar store coming in 2023. It's called Pearl House Collective, and it's a woman-owned, independent bookstore featuring big stories from the small presses. We can appreciate that. Sounds great. And, you know... Pearl House connects you with dynamic, enriching texts that you'll want to share with your family and friends. And Pearl House hosts the Band Book Club of Boise, where community members read recently challenged and banned books and discuss them nicely. So join the community online at Pearl House Collective and at Boise Band Book Club. Hey, Jeff, do you have any murder houses with blood dripping down the walls that need sold and need sold quickly? I might add for this weekend. Fantastic. I have two ladies that are just right for the job. Uh, Melissa Call, my friend and fellow Washingtonian, and Kara Harwick, uh, Eagleite uh, from Eagle, Idaho. They've teamed up and they're a member of Birch Leaf Real Estate uh, out of Eagle, Idaho. And these ladies can... They can sell your, your home quick, whether uh, somebody's been murdered there or not. To learn more, go to www.birchleafgroup.com or reach Melissa or Kara at 208-254-0490. All right. And we are back, Mark. Live and full of jive. That's stupid. Vigor and whim. Vigor and whim. Uh, whimsy. <laughs> that too. So we're <laughs> yeah. So we're talking about the uh, the Boise City election in October of uh, eighteen sixty four. We're talking about kind of the run up to that election. There was a lot of back and forth in the newspapers between the Democrats and Republicans. I mean, nothing changes in that regard, right? Yeah. So the the Republicans started calling themselves the Union Party, uh, probably as a way to take a moral high ground against the treasonous Dems. So, Mark, can you read that quote from the Idaho Statesman on September 20th, 1864? Sure, Jeff. Uh, the title of this news item is Union Men Rally. And so it reads, the approaching election should warn every true and loyal Union man to be at his post in this time of our country's peril. It is no time to cry peace, but let the Union Party with one united shout proclaim the battle cry of freedom. The coming political contest is an important one to the future interests of Idaho territory. Let us be by our actions, words, and votes, say that Idaho, the gem of the mountains, 
the young, fairest, and most beautiful of her sister territories, is true to the common cause and is in favor of union, and opposed to the surrender of the rights of the citizens of the United States to any self-constituted and self-styled southern chivalry or knights of the golden circle. Ha ha! Excellent. Forsooth. Forsooth. Excellent reading there, Mark. I Thank you, that. sir. Thank you. You're going to have to use that voice for all my news please reports from now on. Indubitably. <laughs> so, yeah, but I think this passage kind of shows that the people of Idaho Territory were very much aware of the threat that secessionists could carry the territory away from the path of statehood. And so the election was actually held on Monday, October 10th, 1864. And, you know, there, there are some fears that there would be some violence at the polls, but fortunately that did not happen. Um, but something kind of untoward did occur during the election. And Mark, you found the document that kind of set us off on looking into that. Can you tell us about the John Z. White letter? Well, yeah. Yeah. So basically, old John described the scene as the citizens of Boise City uh, for what it was at that time. You know, whatever it was at that time, a city, a town, a village. Not much. Uh, not much, right? You got like five saloons. Yeah. And maybe a few mercantiles or brothels, <laughs> which were basically, I don't know, you laid on an old mattress in the back and it was made of freaking straw. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But they were harassed by Price's Army. The voters were harassed by this Price's Army, quote, end quote. Um, and it was basically a paramilitary crew that made haste uh, from Missouri, right, after the Battle of Westport, largely. Which was, what was that called? The Gettysburg of the West? Yeah. So it was a big mm-hmm. cavalry battle that happened there in 1864, right? Um, but White estimated, the, the author of this letter, he basically estimated that uh, 600 of these Price's Army cadets, uh, I'm sure this is an overstatement or an overestimate, made trouble and kept folks in Boise City from voting. Yeah, so that's kind of interesting, that letter, right? Yeah, I mean, it was just sometimes you kind of, I'd like to say I was some genius in the archives, and I was like, look at this. <laughs> it's exactly what I was looking for. But no, I just saw an old cool letter, um, and I had looked up uh, Riot and 1864 election, which really didn't happen. So yeah, he uses that riot, that term riot, but um, riot doesn't always mean what we think it does. You know, a riot can just be any kind of like disorderly conduct, that type of thing. So are we talking like a guar concert, <laughs> motorhead style riot, you know, maybe a good rage against the machine raging? What are we what are we talking about here? Well, you know, rage against the machine would come to Boise a few years later. Oh, yeah. Uh, what? 1866, right? Yep, exactly. Or was it 1996? Yeah, so. <laughs> so. White mentions that these men were from, he called it Price's Army, right? So I want to do a quick overview on what that exactly means. So there's a dude named Sterling Price. He gained some military experience during the Mexican-American War, where he led a cavalry unit from Missouri. And there's a story that he, during the Mexican-American War, like the, the, the Treaty of, is it the Treaty of Hidalgo? Guadalupe Hidalgo. Yeah, that's what it was. Oh, okay. uh, had been signed. And so he had orders not to invade <laughs> this. Uh, I think it was Chihuahua. Uh, and then for some reason, he thought that the rebels or whoever in Chihuahua were going to attack into the United States. So against orders, he took his cavalry troops down and invaded this Mexican state right after the, the treaty. And he was aware that the treaty had been signed. But he actually... Uh, um, was praised by President Polk for his actions there. So, Just poking around. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Polk that. <laughs> so anyway, his uh, his kind of his military successes helped him get elected as the governor of Missouri in 1852. He served until the year of 1857. Um, so when the southern states actually started to succeed from the Union, uh, Price actively campaigned to keep Missouri in the Union. And there's kind of some indication that he was kind of playing both sides. Like he maybe was just trying to go who with whatever side he thought might have been the winner. Um, if you're interested in this, like I can't really, you know, we can't really go into much more detail uh, in this kind of this episode. But it's a fascinating story if you're interested in the Civil War at all. Um, 
Anyway, so when the Union troops under Captain Nathaniel Lyons entered Missouri, Price was given command of what they called the Missouri State Guard, which was the state militia. After the initial skirmish that the State Guard fought with Union troops, the Union Army was actually able to overrun um, the State Guard and take control of most of Missouri, and the Union would hold Missouri throughout most of the war. Uh, so now that their homes were in control of the federal troops, the soldiers of Price's armies were ordered to join the rest of the Confederate forces and continue the fight. So most of these men didn't sign up to fight for the Confederate States of America. You know, they were fighting to protect their homes because, you know, whether the Union cause is just or not, you have to look at it from that day and age of a state's rights kind of thing, you know. Each state was pretty much its own country at the time. Exactly. You know, Robert E. Lee, uh, in the end, turned down a commission uh, to lead the Union Army and went to fight for his home state of Virginia. You know, it's funny you mentioned Robert E. Lee. Because we're talking about the Knights of the Golden Circle. He was actually held captive by KGC uh, members in Texas for a while. No. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Why? Uh, so there was kind of that, that time period where, you know, the states were seceding. Um, he was offered a commission by President Lincoln to, use the, to lead the Union Army. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, when these members of the KGC... Um, kidnapped him basically they were trying to convince him to uh fight for the south which he eventually did yeah i mean because you know it was about your state you know we think of america as a whole you know but but then it was very much like it was a union of states instead of a nation of states you know what i mean right yeah because if we look at the word state it it refers to more of a, a an autonomous political entity like if we were talking about like say the balkan states or you know european states they're like their own countries yeah so exactly um and so you know when when as they saw it the federal army invaded missouri um you know they were gonna fight for their homes Um, And so, you know, some of these guys did own slaves, but we're not talking about the large plantations that come to mind. You know, we're talking about what would be like a westernized version of slavery. These aren't wealthy plantation owners for the most part, although they're wealthy men. So they were fighting uh, oftentimes for their, you know, for their little hamlet their area and so there's a great book called woe to live on and i forget the author's name but it is an awesome book turned into a movie called ride with the devil by ang lee and it shows you what the civil war was like between like the kansas and the missouri area very violent think northern ireland Mm -hmm. assassinations and things like that talk about the jay hawkers the jay hackers jay Jay hackers Hackers. jay hackers (laughs) the jay hackers and the bushwhackers the missouri boys Mm -hmm. um you know so anyway i digress but uh don't digress quite yet because i kind of want to mention that that's kind of the environment that led to like the rise of like jesse james and kind of the outlaws and once you really think about like the old west yeah so so the lines weren't so clearly drawn in missouri and kansas or the west but you know what you had especially in uh, there was a there was a conflict going on called bleeding kansas before and it all had to do with how slavery uh, would continue on in the West. Would it continue on the West? You know, Kansas, it was not a slave state. It was an abolition state. Missouri was. And so you had uh, killings and brutalities going on before. And and so you had these outlaws. You knew how to ride horses, use pistols. They knew the land. And they knew how to ambush people. So you had atrocities Um, And, you know, you had this tit for tat kind of thing that had already developed prior to the Civil War. And so this continued on and got worse. So a lot of these guys learned how to rob, fight and just be ruthless like the James gang or uh, well, my favorite is uh, he died. But bloody Bill Anderson, what a bad but also mystifying, mysterious, interesting guy. Quantrell's Raiders. Mm hmm. Uh, Lawrence, Kansas, the raid on Lawrence, Kansas. But these guys, some of these guys, if I'm right, were in Price's army. Right. These kind of folks. And actually, while we're on that subject, um, 
and talking about kind of confederacy confederate series in the pacific northwest cole younger who was jesse james's oh, yeah. cousin right yeah uh the younger gang there were a few right so, yeah i think they were cousins to the james boys uh, but the, the james and youngers kind of formed a, a mega gang after a while yeah, right so they called it james younger gang cole younger actually helped a confederate spy get from texas um to california through mexico and then up to vancouver uh, canada to help uh, get some documents to the British government so the Confederacy could buy, could purchase uh, ships that they called commerce traders. So the goal was that they would um, have their ships docked on Vancouver Island and actually come down and attack the gold shipments and stuff like that on the West Coast. Wow. That's another one of those little conspiracies. Prior to this, I had no idea what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> right? A. Actually, there was... Uh, but there's, that's so interesting. Yeah, there's quite a few uh, Confederate sympathizers in British Columbia to the point where there's actually stars and bars uh, flying. The Confederate flag was actually flying in some places in British Columbia. Yeah. Uh, I think Jeff and I are showing our... We love to talk about the Civil War because uh, while it's clear... It, in these times that slavery is wrong and that the enslaved peoples of the United States definitely uh, deserve their freedom. Um, for people back then, not everybody saw it as clearly as we see it now, you know, especially like abolitionists, right? We talked about Abe Lincoln, but Abe Lincoln in his own letters was uh, really a, a colonist or mm -hmm. colonialist type view where he want, he did not think white people and black people could live together. And so he wanted, you know, either to send black populations out west uh, where they could be black americans there or to africa because he thought coexistence wasn't possible though they deserve their freedom and so you know we idaho presents us this chance to look at these very unexplored ideas about the civil war um where we can kind of reframe it how people back then saw it and so price's army comes from these roots right um and they were, anyway, you know, we're talking about the West. And so to go West, um, you know, it was an annual migration, right? And yeah. so Price's Army, these are some of those immigrants uh, that White referred to, to go back to White and his letter talking about the election in Boise City. Um, White is referring to these immigrants, these particular immigrants. Um, but to get to the sources um, where we always go to the either really good secondary source material from historians or we go to the primary materials. So we can't just take one man's small letter that he wrote um, as if that's the God's honest truth. Um, so what else do you have, Jeff, to prove that there was uh, election fraud? So about three days after the election, a news item appeared in the Idaho Statesman. So basically, this news item was claiming that a large number of immigrants had voted in the election despite not meeting the residency requirements. They had to, a person had to have had resided in the territory for a certain amount of time to be eligible to vote. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about this quote election fraud is people that were not eligible to vote actually voting in this election. And then on October 25th, a, another full column story reiterates these claims and adds that most of these immigrants have been members of Price's army. The paper goes on to note that union men of the territory were defeated by about 600 votes, which can only be accounted for by the immigrant vote. And that number, 600, just happens to line up with what John Z. White mentioned in his letter. So it might not be an overestimate. It might not be. Oh, wow. I mean, we're talking about there were thousands of people on the Oregon Trail coming out west during this time period. So I don't think it's much of a stretch to say 600 or so might have been Missourians that were coming out west. It's funny, you know, this brings to mind, just to cut you off, sure. but uh, it's funny to think, you know, we look at today as the only time in American history or, you know, a lot of people think like, what's going on in America today? Allegations of fraud, uh, voter fraud, you know, 
no opinion thrown out on that. But what I'm saying is, is that it happened all the time. It's nothing new. It's sensationalism in the paper, doctored up facts. You know, that's how we've always been easy humans to manipulate and basically herd into one side or the other. You know, democracy is chock full of um, cheating. And some say, well, who's the guy with Thaddeus Stevens, uh, right, to go to Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation? Um, there was quite, if you've seen Spielberg's movie about Lincoln, there was quite a bit of fraud involved in that. <laughs> um, although I'm very glad that that happened because it needed to. Right. But, you know, hey, they cheated to get to that very important needed step. It's true. Um yeah, so the statesman goes on actually to say that many of the members of Price's armies, after voting illegally in Idaho, or, you know, Boise, Idaho Territory, they moved on, uh, they kept moving west, and they influenced elections in Oregon, uh, especially in Wasco, Umatilla, and Baker counties. And, you know, I, I checked the, uh, the election returns on those elections as well, and they all did happen to vote Democrat in the presidential election, which was the, the month after the election that we're talking about in Boise. Is there any other, you know, proof that these members of Price's Army wound up in Oregon? <laughs> Price's Army, how they, they rolled through Boise, possibly interflu- in, interfluenced, possibly influenced the 1864 election and then moved on into Oregon. Um, I mentioned that they were in some of those uh, eastern counties in Oregon and how they influenced their elections as well. Mark, you asked me if there's any other proof that uh, some of these members of Price's armies wound up there. And I was about to tell you before commercial break that there really is. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. We do research projects for you know clients if they want their family histories, property histories, um, stuff like that done. If people's houses are haunted, that's always fun. We, yeah, we actually did find the well, possible uh, identity of a ghost recently. That was fun. That was kind of fun. And uh, she was happy. Our client was happy. I think so. The man in the attic. I don't think we've ever not made a client happy. Well, not in our the history profession. <laughs> okay. So... I was working on one of our projects recently for our, uh, our you know, our, one of our favorite customers. Her name is Tammy Guzman. Um, Shout out to Tammy, man. Yeah, Tammy. She's great. Tammy. Uh, so Tammy's, I think it was her second great grandfather was buried in a cemetery called Wingville Cemetery, which is outside of uh, Baker City, Oregon. So the community of Wingville is actually named after these members of Price's Army, which were referred to as I've seen it referred to as either the left or right wing of Price's Army. So if you look up uh, Wingville Cemetery and find a grave, you'll actually see a lot of Confederate headstones there. Yeah, I mean, they were out in the West just winging it. Winging it. Figuring out how they were going to survive, mm-hmm. maybe spread the Confederacy. Is that a wing song you were just singing? My favorite Paul McCartney band. <laughs> 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 Ooh, um, wow. What the hell am I talking about, Jeff? I don't know. Uh, so, so we have a couple of primary sources. Um, essentially, you know, uh, a letter, uh, the the white letter, um, and the newspaper accounts from the time period, and um, that say uh, members of Price's army influenced the eighteen sixty four election vote in Boise City. Um, and so, basically, you know, a primary source is from that day and age. You know, you get. You know, letters from people, correspondence between different politicians, oral histories or interviews, you know, things like that. Um, and uh, newspapers are really in a position to witness the events for themselves. Exactly. Um, but we also have used, you know, credible secondary sources and secondary sources are like, you know, professors of history, um, you know, local historians that have practiced it their whole life, archivists, whatever. Um, and they look at good primary source material and then they analyze it and then uh, chalk it up in their book and explain it to you, hopefully in an entertaining package. Um, and this is secondary material. And then they footnote the sources that they use, um, you know, basically listing out everything um, in their book. 
kind of like we did in our book, Murder Man in Boise, which is uh, available wherever you get your books. Yeah, Jeff, that's chock full of great primary source material about the most horrible we could find. That's correct. Jeff is a king at finding the weirdest, wackiest, and most uh, mayhem-filled stories, and so we fi- we fill the book with some of the craziest stories we could find. That's right, and we're following it up with another book about ghost stories. Oh yeah, Haunted America, Boise. Um, you know, we we've definitely gone to the primary materials on that one. You know. Um, Jeff looked into Satanism in the hills and dark spirits and how people felt, uh, what, in the 1960s, 70s, 80s? Yeah. About Satanic Panic. Satanic Panic. Satanic Panic. Sounds like a band. It would be a great band. Yeah. Yeah. We are Satanic Panic, Boise. But anyway. Like a mashup, like Satanic Panic at the disco. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Satanic Panic at the disco. Oh, that's great. Um, I looked into uh, the Boise murder house or the chop chop house. Oh, yeah. Right. That's such a crazy story. Yeah. But I've noticed that everybody, you know, there there are those that look into it and say, hey, it wasn't a frat house because it wasn't. Uh, college kids did live there but some people just throw out the bs and they want to you know oh, this is the story but people take that and they believe that really happened and then it gets repeated and then it gets repeated through, and then people through all these like podcasts and books that we've read on this subject like it's, they're just saying the same thing but they're not going back to these primary sources exactly. and checking the facts yeah one it was actually a really well, well done podcast called dark house and they they did a whole series or a whole episode on this uh Boise murder house they did a pretty good job but they said that they thought it was probably a lore or uh, one of those local kind of legends that said the house was built by sandstone from table rock and i was like oh hey no no that's that's bs yeah that is definitely table rock sand Mm -hmm. um stone you know so i looked into that and I found, you know, the the date the home does date back to like 1910 and that, it, you know, it was like an old folks home. And there's stories of a haunting that doesn't have to do with what happened there in 1987. But we look into that, you know, um, and so really can't do all that cool stuff without primary source material. And we want to be great secondary source material based on that primary source material. Um but anyway, which we're lucky to have a few sources like that for Idaho, right? You know, yeah. And so there there are some and you have to have a kind of critical eye when you read them. But they are old, old secondary sources. Um, like there are a couple classic te- texts about Idaho. You know, John Haley's aptly named The History of Idaho and James Hawley's, well, History of Idaho, Gem of the Mountains. So you get that so, colon in there. Oh, Idaho. yeah. History of Idaho, colon, Jim of the Mountains. I mean, I think I think he should clear his colon. <laughs> yes. You know, maybe just put a common, whatever. Anyway, it's good. He um, seemed and like it, a guy that ate a lot of fatty foods. So. Yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, like modern art on the wall, you know yeah. what I mean? I mean, you can't cut that part out. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, so, and then there's also uh, a great, I would call it, if it's the McConnell, William McConnell um, book that I'm thinking of, uh, History of Idaho, is that where he describes his uh, vigilante days and all that? Uh, he mentions himself in the third person in this one, which is kind of weird to read. Um, but he. Like Bob Doe. I'm Bob Doe. <laughs> Bob Doe likes you. Yes. Uh, he No, he has several other books. Um, one's called, I think it might be the one you're thinking of, is called. Uh, um, frontier justice oh yeah that's the one yes. and i do think he was a badass guy but he's always honorable and just and completely paints himself as you know the western badass yep. clint eastwood type yeah but it's great information it is. yeah yeah and so we love those kind of things but um Anyway, in, in these sources, uh, all three of them, they talk about Price's army in Idaho. Um, Haley relied on letters and interviews with people uh, who actually witnessed these things happen and the events that, that Haley was writing about. Um, he has a letter from a guy named J.S. Butler, 
who, along with his brother, started the Boise News. Uh, and it was the first newspaper in the southern part of the territory, Idaho Territory. Uh, after more than a year, they sold the paper to us to these southern Democrats who wanted their own paper. Um, and he says it was during the most exciting times of the rebellion and the parties here were formed on the questions involved in that great issue. And as a great many of Price's army, when it disbanded, found their way to Idaho, um, that the party prevailed. And so after the paper that the, that quote just came from, after the paper was sold, it was changed. It's it, the name was changed to the Idaho world from Idaho city. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And so Holly's history pretty much just copies Haley's on this matter. So it's interesting when you read, um, you take, the Idaho statesmen and the Idaho world, and you put them next to each other on the same topics. The statesman was Republican owned. The Idaho world was Democrat owned. So they obviously disagree with each other on a lot of events. They go back and forth for sometimes weeks on a certain subject. Oh, these two hated it. each other. <laughs> they, did. they did. And it's awesome to read these. And it's, it's just like this rivalry that these two newspapers had. It's awesome to read some stuff. And yeah, it's we like get, desperate we'll, housewives that hate each other, just like <laughs> slamming each other. And, a lot of drama. No, oh, yeah. And when we talk about the vigilantes uh, later on, we'll talk more about kind of that rivalry because it really pops up during the vigilante episodes in Southern Idaho. Yeah. Speaking of vigilantes, uh, William J. McConnell was actually a vigilante, and that's w one of the reasons that I like talking about him so much. He's an interesting guy, like Mark said. Um but in his book, McConnell, uh, he goes more into depth. And I like this quote. It's quite lengthy, um, but I love his writing style. And he actually puts it into perfect context. So kind of bear with us on this, this long quote. So McConnell says, During the interval that had elapsed since the election of Wallace, and he's referring to the first territorial governor, William Wallace. William Wallace? Not the... Not the Scottish guy. Freedom! <laughs> exactly. That guy? I knew you were going to do that when I talked about him. Um, so he says, During the interval that had elapsed since the election of Wallace, what was known then as the, quote, left wing of Price's army had been scattering its red plumes and feathers all over the vast intermountain region at that time embraced within the boundaries of Idaho Territory. The warriors composing this contingent of the Confederate Army, having become tired of the restraints and hardships of military life and the apparently hopeless task of confronting the hordes of, quote, northern abolitionists who continued to invade and overran, overrun their fair land. Northern had, aggressor. They had concluded to resign in a body and migrate westward where the more congenial task of taking charge of the political destiny of Idaho awaited them. And so they came and continued to come with ox whip in one hand and the ballot in the other. And by frequent and persistent voting soon changed the complexion of things political. Mark, why don't you help me out with the rest of that? Your best McConnell voice. Well, the foraging is probably right so far as the political affiliations of these overland arrivals was concerned. Yet it is a mistake to credit all of them, or, for that matter, any great number of them, with having belonged formerly to the Confederate Army. A few had possibly at one time followed some Confederate leader, but nearly all of them were refugees trying to escape the horrors of civil war. Husbands and wives, their children, and such of their possessions as they had rescued from the wrecks of their former homes, turned westward, in fact, fled from the intracene strife which ha was dotting the land with graves. They came in hope of finding peace rather than to engage in contests of political or otherwise. Well, I really like that how he talks he, he says he basically goes over what we were just talking about how it's not a black and white thing there's a lot of gray area going on here although you know really um when it comes down to it the civil war was very much a black and white thing oh my god 
That's I'm leaving. That's a bad joke. Okay, you should punch. Will you punch me on the chin? If I could reach you, I could. <laughs> so McConnell goes on to say that these people being war being war refugees only voted along the same lines they would have voted at home. And then he talks about how his father was a free soil abolitionist and how he himself was a Republican in these days. Free soil abolitionist, Mark, does that mean that they were basically wanting to open up the West to settlement and give them free land, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah basically. Um, but of course, McConnell himself was a Republican. And then he goes on, he says, but, um, quote, I met these people in both social and business way. And I stand ready now, as I did then, to voice for the man estimable qualities and lovable characteristics of those who were called, quote, the left wing of Parsons' army. Now, McConnell also goes on to talk about how the Democratic Party in Idaho elected a lot of lawless and bad men. But it was not because that, you know, overall they were bad people. It was because the bulk of them only invo- only voted in general elections and had nothing to do with the nominations or party primaries. And, you know, McConnell knew a thing or two about Idaho politics because he was our third state governor. So, you know, and of course, this led to the election. Well, I say, of course, to Jeff, because we know this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, it led to the election of our first Ada County sheriff um, that will have to save his story uh, for another date. But his name was David Updike. He was the first Ada County sheriff, as I said, and he was what arguably could be labeled as a piece of shit. Yes. Yes. Agreed. So, yeah, anyway, there's one last aspect to this story that we need to cover. But, uh, Jeff, you mentioned that a lot of these uh, Price's Army folks moved to Oregon, uh, but not all of them did. Some of these guys settled west of Boise City on the Boise River. Uh, They called the area Dixie, uh, but now we call it Caldwell. The Dixie name survives in, you know, the form of the Dixie Slough. Uh, a short tributary of the Boise River that runs from near where Simplot, the Simplot plant is in Caldwell, um, down near Greenleaf. Yeah. Uh, Dixie River Road run, runs along it. So, you know, we have these little leftovers from that time and place. Of course. So I'll tell you a little bit about a guy who was a member of Price's Army um, who pioneered Dixie. His name was Thomas T. Johnson. Mark, do you remember that picture that I sent you? I was going to send it to you again, but the dude had that sweet beard that goes all the way to the ground. Do you remember yeah. that photo? Yeah. yeah. So apparently it was called the longest beard in America at one point. Like this is a, a, a ZZ top looking beard. It's beautiful. Like there's probably things living in that beard, you know, it's yeah. so long. Kind of scro, you know, sc- Groat. It's kind of <laughs> gross and scraggly. It's a little scroty. It's a little scroty. You know? well, I don't know. <laughs> So, <laughs> what kind of scrote we're talking about there, man. Uh, anyway, so i'm gonna post that picture with this episode because everybody needs to see this beard so but anyway uh in 1909 the idaho statesman ran an article about him and they said thomas t johnson a pioneer of 64 1864 of course uh he camped on the south side of the boise river opposite boise city on July 15th, 1864. Later, he proceeded down the valley and stopped near where the city of Caldwell is now located. This vicinity was then called Dixie in honor of the many Missourians wintering there and was the most thickly settled part of the valley outside of Boise City. You can actually go visit Johnson's cabin in the Van, I think it's Van Slyke Agricultural Museum in Memorial Park in Caldwell. Um, but I think the Johnson brothers, uh, they did some other cool interesting things so they might get their own episode someday i heard that uh, thomas johnson was a bit of a dixie <laughs> <laughs> jeez oh, wow that's a bad joke excuse me so anyway uh mark that's all i got on the 1864 boise city election so what do you what are you thinking on this whole thing what are your thoughts let us in to your brain you know i think it's great i think it's great because it opens up so many conversations about, uh, well, the origins of Idaho, but also kind of what the Civil War 
was in its murkiness you know not and i'm not talking in in terms of right and wrong i'm talking of just what was um i think a lot of people just like you know with the revolution right when we talk about america uh during the revolution or during the civil war we always look at our history with a, an eastward lens until after the civil war but we got to talk about what was happening during the Civil War, right? And all these huge moments in American history that, that impacted what would be Idaho, um, you know, from the Mormon trek trekkers in the 1850s that the federal government almost went to war with. But should it have not been for the Civil War, we probably would have had a small war against the the Mormons in, in what? Utah and southern Idaho. Yeah, in the 1850s. There was actually, they called it the Mormon War, but there was actually no shots fired, so. Yeah, and then we, you know, so, and then we're talking about, you know, well, so you have these Union supporters and you have these Confederate supporters um, or ex-Unionists and Confederate, you know, soldiers in some instances um, that maybe run away, but they're in towns like Placerville and they're out in the, you know, square and waiting for the news to get in from back east. And then, you know, you have these guys finding out, you know, that the Union or the Confederacy like fought each other and won a battle or lost a battle. And they're out there and they're not killing each other. But back east, they would be killing each other, you know, and maybe, you know, they did kill each other, but for different reasons. I mean, there was some violence that did occur as a result of, you know, the the conflict out west here. I mean, there were fistfights, certainly, um, or about the story of uh, uh, Pinkham. Pinkham, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a whole crazy story. What was the guy, Patterson? Patterson and Pinkham, yeah. What was his Patterson's first name? Ferd. Ferd Patterson. Yeah, yeah. not Not Fred. Fred. Yeah. Ferd. <laughs> Maybe his parents were, you know, hammered when they was came up with his name. Ferdinand or something was that his oh, real name? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. He was a bull of a man. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> Pinkham. That's a bad joke. I don't get that right there. Sorry. Um, you even watch too many kids' movies. Yeah. Well, Pinkham was a federal marshal at mm-hmm. one point, right? And but he, he was also a union man. Union man, and he would like ride down through Idaho City. Um, with like the American flag, he would sing Union songs, you know, or hum them. Um, and, you know, uh, he was shot down eventually by Ferd Patterson, who was a strong, he was a outlaw. He was like arguably a violent man right. um, from the start, but he was known to be a Confederate sympathizer supporter. Right. And that happened after the war, though, right? But the, yeah. the tension was still there, of course. Yeah. Um, I know up in Lewiston during the war or the early days of the war, there was um, um, Talbot, uh, Buffalo or not Buffalo. What do they call him? Talbot. Anyway, he's buried in Florence, um, but he actually uh, caused a little a little brawl with some Union troops in a, an opera house. Like he, they were watching the show and he kept yelling at these Union troops to kind of egg them on and ended up shooting the guys. So there, no. there was certainly violence. Um, there yeah. were fist fights. Um, well, Patterson shot Pinkham mm-hmm. um, at the old Warm Springs uh, Resort, which is now, from what I understand, where the the Springs Twin Springs, the Springs yeah. in Idaho City, uh, was, and and he died. And so there was this uh, manhunt for Patterson, right? Mm-hmm. And is this the one where they arrested him and they had him in jail? And McConnell comes in, as he says, and stops this second civil war from happening yeah. between these union supporters that wanted his hide. Yep. And then the the southern supporters that wanted to keep him from his fate. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I, I forget a year or two later, maybe not even that, he's in Walla Walla, Washington, which was a big you know town in those days. Uh, he's sitting in a barber chair and somebody that they think was paid by uh, the elite of the vigilantes, the Boise Vig- City vigilantes and the Idaho City vigilantes pay it. Mm-hmm. Somebody that was in their employ uh, went in and said, hey, he threatened me. And so I'm going to go in and shoot Patterson. Which was the way you dealt with things back then. Yeah. And you could actually say not in every case did it work, but oh, this guy threatened me two days ago. So I jumped. 
I literally jumped the gun and I shot him. Yeah. Um, you know, and so these these ideas, these sides and rivalries and tensions, like Jeff was saying, travel far beyond the borders of these wars. Right. You and then you have, you know, Florence, one of the, you know, which was like the, where the second major gold rush happened in Idaho. Um, that town, like they called their main street the Mason-Dixon line mm-hmm. because, you know, it was so split between these, you know, northern, northerners and southerners. Yeah, yeah. and they were sending a message yeah. to the other, you know. And, um, and I think the, you know, if these men weren't fighting for their very existence every day, I think there probably would have been more violence. Yeah, they didn't them. have time, all you know, to to always do that. They're trying to make fortunes, and then mining was hard mm-hmm. work, and you had to be on guard. Um, but you know, even the Union Block building in in Boise, where uh, Moon's Kitchen or whatever that's a uh, great old restaurant. But yeah, Mai Tai is there too. Yeah, Mai Tai, right? Yeah. Shoot, that wasn't made until what into the nineteen hundreds, like nineteen oh five or so, something around there. I'm not probably exactly correct on that but that was an intentional slam or slap in the face of of confederates and that's what that's like 35 40 years later i mean what what 150 ish years removed from the civil war now and it seems like uh in a lot of ways it's still being fought that's uh, yeah right that's why i love when people say and i actually hate when people say this so i don't love but i think it's completely stupid when people are like oh history doesn't matter or why does history matter uh well sure it does yeah. <laughs> you know we're still yeah. fighting over these narratives in history and so it applies to idaho um and you know you can get into this great i think you and i share jeff why we do this podcast among this business together idaho history is because we're interested in uh, not just what people want to be true but trying to get an idea of what was true and thus what is true we do talk a lot of uh uncomfortable things in this business in our books and our our uh our tours and you know it's it's right yeah Yeah, we want to talk about these kind of things on on this podcast more we're going to focus on events that perhaps have been overlooked because they're uncomfortable um you know from prostitution uh, of violence against women, anything that has to do with the Civil War and the you know great conflagration of the United States that was the battle over slavery and its future in the West, um, to you know uh, what the Snake River War that's one you wanted to cover and I yeah. think it's a good topic. Yeah, basically you know removing Native Americans from their land in Southern Idaho, like yeah, yeah, that's a very fraught topic that we'll we'll dive into yeah we're not we're not the only and it was tied to the civil war and the fact that not many people know about the snake river war at least at all but the 1864 part because you know the civil war was going on or in 1863 the the beer river massacre um which definitely was a massacre you know and all these things so we're gonna you know i talked about jeff standard for a little bit on this episode but there was a whole um battle that he fought that's been pretty much erased from history and that was right after bear river like what four or five months after bear river but we don't talk about that like that whole massacre like you could call it a massacre because up to 100 some natives were i mean i think some of these numbers were inflated maybe but i think that uh for some reason that one has been forgotten by history oh yeah and these numbers game you know they're definitely political you know how many but the bear river massacre is worse than you know as far as it, they're all equally horrible but yeah. as far as numbers it's the uh, highest number of people massacred uh than in any other massacre of native american peoples unfortunately that one was not forgotten because of the mormon because of the mormons who uh documented it right after and you know yeah. kept that helped keep that narrative alive so you know the diesel blinks good whether right or wrong in that you know some 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 mormons you know uh documented it differently than others but you know you can see just what happened on the ground level because of what uh these mormon uh, settlers witnessed and described in their letters and tellings of the event exactly all right so you got anything else on the 1864 election any other thoughts like everything else, it's more complicated than you think. 
Yeah. Um, and that's our theme. And right. we probably didn't even get into a lot of other aspects that we could have gone into in this episode. And there's like, there's just so much that, you know, was interesting. And yeah. And that's just in Idaho. And exactly, then what, yeah. what happened outside of Idaho that re- relates to Idaho. And then, you know, one of the things I didn't mention is uh, while this election was going on, Sterling Price was actually trying to reinvade Missouri to prevent the re-election of Lincoln from happening. So yeah that's right all right so with that i think we're done uh we will see y'all next time thanks for listening <laughs> thanks for listening we're out of history and uh you know follow our podcast become listeners and we're gonna get right into the thick of a lot of you know history you might not have heard about all right, perfect all right i think with that we'll give it to tom if you want to get a hold of us send an email to info at idahistory.com Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Ida History. You can visit us on the web at idahistory.com. Ida History would like to thank our listeners, sponsors, and contributors. If you want to know how you can become a contributor, go to idahistory.com slash podcast. Please consider giving us a rating and review on your podcast app. I'm Tom Hart, and this is Devil's County. You know, I'd like to pause for a second and, and talk about Umatilla. Yeah. It's a historic town um, on the Columbia River. You know it when you drive through because you can see all the bunkers. Yeah, yeah, right? Hanford. Yeah. Is that Hanford out there? I think so. But I remember a time when I was a younger man and uh, I went to a place. This has nothing to do with history. I just <laughs> think it's funny. But we went to a place, and I don't know if it was officially called that, but it was. I was a best man uh for my buddy zach fife and uh fife what's up <laughs> yeah bro <laughs> but we took him this poor guy to a place called the yuma titty oh and it was a it was a strip club in umatilla so it may be no offense umatilla it wasn't like showgirls in seattle a very classy <laughs> classy place but i went outside to hang out and drink a beer with zach's stepbrothers not stepbrothers uh brothers-in-law and uh, I had got him a, a complete lap dance, but he played for the Central Washington football team. He was the center, and he's like 300 some pounds, big dude, slapped me away like nothing, like a fly. Yeah. But they, they handcuffed him to this pole, <laughs> and I think his, his shoulder came dislodged. Oh, ouch. So he's sitting there in horrible pain as these all the strippers in the joint are giving him a dance. <laughs> Okay. And so that happened to me in Yuma, in the Yuma Titty, in Umatilla. All right. Um, right in this historic heart of uh, yeah. clandestine Confederate history. You know, you could have mentioned that, you know, this is where the supplies and stuff were offloaded from the river for the mines. But, well, the Price's you know, Army really club. enjoyed the Yuma Titty. I'm sure they did. It's been a strip club since 1864. An institution. Yep. <laughs> Take off thy frock, Mother Maybelline. <laughs> so anyway, Jeff, so anyway. Um, is there any other you know proof that these members of Price's Army wound up in Oregon at the Umatitty? <laughs> <laughs>